So what could you do if you chose to live a more intentional life? Well, maybe you could be like me in my backyard here for the first time ever recording a podcast, living my best life here in Claremont, Florida, right? I don't even know where I live today. With that, right, I could also be talking to friends, having a podcast, or wait, that's what I'm doing because I chose this. And what I love about today's guest, my friend, Sean Rosenstiel, is he is an intentional guy. Now, he hasn't always been, and we're going to talk about that because sometimes that doesn't happen. But he put out there that he wanted to sell a 1,000 copies of his book, The School for Intentional Living. And holy crap, he did that. And he's, in fact, he's way surpassed that Amazon number one. Great guy, good friend, known him for a long time through thick, thin, and all sorts of crazy stuff. But he's here to talk to us today about his latest book. And I say latest because I know you're going to write more, The School for Intentional Living. What's up, John? How are you, buddy? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks, Phil. I'm so excited to be here. I watch you all the time live, and now I'm actually on your show. So thanks for having me. Yeah, totally, man. I wouldn't miss it. I wouldn't miss it. I'm so glad that you're here, too. So I got to tell you, though, what the heck possessed you to write a book? Because writing a book is not an easy path. It's not like you wake up and you're like, yay, today I'm done writing a book. So what possessed you, bro? I'm coming after you. How many books uh -oh. have you published? Five or uh -oh. six, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, five, five, uh, yeah, five or six. Yep, that's right. With a couple more comments, sure. Yeah, so no, you know, I've, me. I've been an avid reader for a while, and uh, I really appreciate and I've always admired authors for their ability to, you know, put organize and clarify their thoughts into the written word, and really have yeah. that courage to expose themselves to public criticism. Right. So it was my way of, I guess, giving back and making a small contribution in my own unique way. And it's something that's been on my radar screen for a handful of years. I finally had this idea in late 2019 as far as the entry point into how I could write about this very broad topic of intentional living. Uh, so it's been kind of a bucket list item for me personally. And uh, yeah, I've got a few other ideas that I'd like to pursue. But you know, first things first, the focus right now is on this uh, freshman attempt, so to speak. Wow. Freshman, rookie, whatever it is, man, it's a really good book. And I'm glad Thank you me. wrote it because you know, you did tackle some important stuff in there. So first, let, before we even talk about that, Sean, let's let's explain what is intentional living to you, because I think that's an important framework that people need to understand. Yeah, I mean, to me, it just means, you know, making the most of our time each and every day, putting our God-given talents and abilities to good use, uh, making a difference in the lives of those we lead, love, and serve and ultimately i think leaving a lasting legacy you know living a life of importance and significance which i think many of us um you know desire to do cool cool i'd love that i think that's important a lot of us do desire that so sean i talked about how this hasn't always been your gig right you haven't always been captain intentional so let's take us back here <laughs> to when you were a young boy I, read, I have to tell you so we've been friends 10 15 years and i read this i'm like Hold on, hold on. Sean's not always been the wholesome guy that I know. So talk to me about growing up. What a little pain in the butt you were for you. <laughs> I think that's an important framework. It yeah, gives everybody I, hope that they can still turn out as good kids. Right, right. I've been warning my wife of this. You know, we have three kids, six and under now. I'm like, you know, karma's a real you know what. It's, it's coming back. You know, there's, it's only a matter of time before we get those calls from jail asking to bail them out, you know. Uh, so, no, I had a very uh, amazing upbringing and I, you know, I think followed a few role models who were into some pretty reckless behavior uh, during my teenage years. And certainly throughout uh, my college years, I was very blessed to go to college and I, I pursued this idea of conventional success. Right. And I and I, you know, after I graduated, I went into business uh, for myself, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I, I thought, you know, it was all about making a lot of money and having those big homes and, you know, fancy toys and flashy cars and all the rest of it. And I ended up making some pretty foolish decisions and very negligent decisions. And I actually went uh, bankrupt uh, shortly after going into business for myself, after making some poor choices. And when I went bankrupt, it was about 30 days before my wedding date. So it was a very interesting time. Uh, you can imagine the conversation with my future in-laws. It was like the biggest sales presentation <laughs> of my life, right? Uh, so I had to figure things out. And as part of my bankruptcy, you know, you had to disclose all of your debt. And I, I can remember my attorney 
I didn't think much of it at the time, but my re attorney said, okay, is this all of your debt? And I said, well, I do owe my folks a little bit of money. They had you know, lent me some money helping me through college. And then when I entered the real world, they had lent me some more money to get you know, my feet settled in. And I disclosed that debt too. And then I was sitting in my car shortly after filing the, the final paperwork with my attorney. And it dawned on me that my folks would receive this official letter in the mail from the federal government saying that their son had discharged this debt. Uh, so I figured I'd owe them a little bit of a phone call. So I called them and the, the, you know, what they told me that day was something that they told me a hundred times, but I broke the news. And after a long silence, my dad said, Sean, no one is responsible for you, but you. And then my mom chimed in and she said, it's time to find a quiet place and figure things out for yourself. And I was 28 years old, Phil. So at that point in time, after a lot of reckless behavior, you read the book, I kind of streaked across the field and <laughs> bore it all, told a lot, of, you know, confessed a lot and just shared everything that I had, you know, been through. And um, that was the first time in my life that I really answered the wake up call. I had a lot of wake up calls that went unanswered. And that was the first time that I really answered uh, the wake up call and started to figure things out, as my mom had put it. Um, and I think eventually, you know, I thought I was a late bloomer. And I'm like, I can't believe it took this long. I was financially bankrupt, but I was also emotionally, physically, spiritually bankrupt as well. And uh, I couldn't believe it took me that long. But the more and more I talk about this and teach about this intentional living topic, the more I'm understanding, hey, you know, you can be 16, you can be 75. It's more of a psychographic than anything else. And uh, one of my great mentors, Wayne Dyer, talks about the shift that many of us go through. We go from this place of ambition just sheer force and ambition to get things done and to move the needle to a place of more meaning, right? So we want, we, we search for more meaning in our lives. So I feel very fortunate that, that that shift took place. I think now looking back at such an early age in my late twenties. Wow. Wow. So we got one, one viewer here, Anne McNeil. She's a master builder MBA. She's like, thanks for sharing. Certainly agree with that, Sean. I think that's important. So what, why did that wake you up, though? Is it because of your parents? Is it because, you know, you, you just finally hit bottom? Did you wake up and be like, holy crap, what am I doing here? Or some combination of all of that? Two things. Actually, it's one thing. But number one is I had a fiance. And here she is talking about her dream of someday becoming a, a mother and raising a family. And I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, I can't even be responsible for my own life, let alone another human being. Uh, so certainly there was some necessity there. And I also recognize that, you know, I think a lot of us at some point go from a place of what's in it for me to how may I serve. And I think for the first time in my life, embarrassingly enough, I was looking at this from all angles thinking, wow, I'm about to be responsible for this other human being. I better get my act together. But also it was my folks, you know, my parents gave me, you know, their unconditional love my whole life. I was, you know, just had an incredible childhood and I felt like a failure. You know, I felt like I had fouled them. And um, so between that, you know, I, I would call it art. Well, not artificial. It was necessity, but it was responsibility. I felt a sense of responsibility to my future wife. And I felt a sense of responsibility to my to my folks to turn things around and, you know, kind of show them that they did right by me and that they raised me correctly and all the rest of it. that was very good intrinsic motivation for me. And then, of course, the thought of that compelling future, someday raising children of our own um, and being the role model in the household for them as their father figure. So all of those things kind of smacked me like a ton of bricks. It took a long time. <laughs> if you read the book, you know, it took a few tries, a handful of them. But um, yeah, finally got there. Ooh, and still working on it today. <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, I still well, find it's... myself asleep at the wheel going through the motions in certain areas. So for me, it's a lifelong pursuit. You know, it's not something that was like, wow, I'm there. I'm living as intentionally as I can. You know, it's this ongoing process. It's a journey, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's a series of choices, right? Mm -hmm. When we think about intentionality, right? You made a choice and then you made another choice. And really the, the, the beauty of this, I think, and the power of it is the series of choices, the compound effect, if you will, to steal a Darren Hardy word, right? It's yeah. all about the, the compounding of this the daily choice, right? So, so talk to me, Sean, tell me about your days now. I mean, now you've got married, got three kids, right? You're, you're running up the, uh, you know, the, the, the intentional living Academy, right? We're going to be doing that. So 
talk to us about what a day looks like and the choices that you make so people can see how intentional living really plays out for you. Sure. Well, I feel very fortunate to, to own my own business, right? So I may have a little bit more flexibility than others who are pursuing a career. They have, you know, they're employed, right? So I'm very fortunate in that regard. But I typically, I mean, you know my, you know my calendar. I, I disclosed it in the book, but you know, I schedule quite a bit. I feel like if it's not on the schedule, it's not real. And you know, I have this intention to be with my family and spend the evenings with them. But if I'm not scheduling that out and mentally blocking that time, I might be physically with them. I'm physically present, but emotionally and mentally, I'm still at work. So I have to really discover some of those turning points throughout my day. So I'll wake up. I typically run every other morning. I have a little bit of a morn morning routine where I'll do some reading or journaling, a little bit of exercise. I'll have a glass of water. I usually have, uh, I'm very lucky. I have, I try to have breakfast every day with my family. If I don't have any meetings early, I typically roll in at about eight o'clock and uh, I just moved, as you know, from Chicago to Dallas. So I've been very lucky. I'm using my uh, spare bedroom in my brother-in-law's house to work from, which has been fantastic because, you know, three kids, six and under, it gets a little, <laughs> it gets a little chaotic, but I roll in and then I basically plan the work day. So I, you know, look at the calendar, say, okay, what's today? look like? What are my pre-existing commitments? Any conflicts in the schedule that I need to solve for early? Anything I need to prepare for as far as a speech, presentation, meeting, whatever it might be. And then I look at my priorities. So I say, okay, based on what I want to get done at the end of the week, some of the key items I want to, three to seven things that need to get done this week. What are the things I need to focus on today? What are my priorities? So I typically schedule those priorities. And then I have some blocks for email and outreach, right? So text messaging, social media, email, answering uh, to voicemails, things of that nature. I usually get home about 5, 5.30. I have a wonderful dinner with my wife and kids. And then we typically do some family time for an hour or two. I do what is now, Phil, about a 90-minute bedtime routine. It's gotten completely out of control. Whoa. Uh, so <laughs> it's just crazy. So, you know, uh, reading and telling some stories and saying our prayers and all this stuff, it's, it's a little bit out of control. So that needs to be um, condensed a bit, but yeah, about 90 minutes with the kids to do the evening routine, get them in their PJs, wash, brushed, all that good stuff. Then I have about an hour of me time or an hour of time for my wife and myself to kind of get together. And, um, you know, we're two ships passing in the night and attention is a very scarce commodity in our home. You know, we can't seem to uh, get a word in edgewise with these little kiddos. So we tend to connect in the evenings uh, certainly on Sundays, we do about 60 or 90 minutes every Sunday. We have a little touch base because a lot of things go unsaid and a lot of issues that we need to talk about and solve for don't get discussed during the week. So we typically meet on Sundays. But, you know, if you were to look at my calendar, it's pretty routine, but I do block time for spontaneity. So I've got three and a half, four hours during every evening on the weekdays for my family, which is awesome. So we can play games, we can watch movies. We can do homework or schoolwork, which is pretty light at this stage. My oldest is uh, in first grade now. So, um, yeah, it, it's pretty routine. I've gotten into a pretty good habit. And then during the weekends, you know, it's um, completely wide open. My wife keeps me pretty busy, keeps us pretty busy with the kids. And uh, But my weekends just, you know, I, I'm a big fan of variety, too, at the same time as I'm a fan of structure, right? So I need a little variety and some spontaneity in my life, too. So, Typically, I leave that for Saturday and Sunday. Very cool. Wow. That is really structured and yet very spontaneous. And one of the big things you talked about is something that I, I talk about with sales professionals all the time, sales leaders all the time. It's the power of the time block, actually putting stuff on your calendar. And you mentioned something that I've never heard anybody put on their calendar before, and that it's time for spontaneity. Mm. I think that's really interesting, right? Time for spontaneity. So, so talk me through what that might look like and how do you prevent the world from encroaching on your time for spontaneity, Sean? Yeah, well, I think, you know, I think it's we're setting ourselves up for disappointment when we time block and then we don't meet those demands of ourselves because we get interrupted or there's a distraction or whatever else. I think we have to have compassion, more compassion for ourselves as well as for other people. Uh, if you remember the gold rush of the 1840s, and I think now this information age, it's going to be known as like the attention rush, right? It's not easy, as we all know. Our attention and our focus, I believe, is our number one asset. So we need to protect it and we need to do better at directing it, you know, in the appropriate directions, right? So I do my best to hit about 80% compliance. 
every day. If I can hit 80% compliance with the schedule I've laid out in the morning for myself that day, uh, it's a big win. And sometimes I can't do that. So we need to get uh, ready to triage our schedules. Just yesterday I had to do that. I was off track by about two and a half hours. So I came back in my calendar and basically reset things for the afternoon. So those lower priorities that I was going to focus on in the afternoon got pushed to the following day. And I brought up some of my higher priorities from the morning into the afternoon. So we need to get really good at triaging. I'm working my calendar all day, every day. And what's really, I think, powerful, and you, you hit the nail on the head, Phil, is this compound effect. You know, if we have a good day, those good days lead to good weeks. Good weeks lead to months and quarters and years. And you brought up Darren Hardy. I love his uh, penny story. He tells a story in the book, The Compound Effect, about the penny example, right? He says, you know, most people would rather take $3 million today than a penny doubled every day for 31 days, while a penny doubled every one, uh, 31 days is over $10 million. So I think we need to give ourselves a little bit more compassion when our schedules aren't met, but also recognize that if we can hit 70 to 80% of our intention every day, you know, we're going to come up in Ferrer at the end of the week and have a really good productive week. And uh, I've been in sales. You and I have talked a lot about sales strategies and best practices. And I work with a lot of salespeople and they're disciplined, right? They have their, you know, two, three hour blocks of prospecting as a lot of us call it every day. And that really adds up. And if you ask some of those people, you know, how do you get your results? So like, it's simple. I turn off my phone, I shut down my email and I start dialing, you know, or whatever form of prospecting they're doing. So I think a lot of us have to play the long game versus, you know, look in the short term and say, you know, will I make a sale or not today? It's not about that. It's about at bats, right? So how many at bats can we get in a given day? Multiply that by a week and we've got a lot of opportunities, right? Absolutely. I, I love that you talk about those at bats and you love playing the long game. I mean, right now, right, with all the challenges that are going on, we cannot control sometimes the outcome. In fact, mm -hmm. I'd argue we never can. But we can control how many times we swing. We can't control our number of at bats, right? Those lead indicators. So we have to find those. So Sean, talk to me about what your lead indicators look like and how we can find our own. Because I think sometimes, you know, we say this in the abstract, right? Hey, find your lead indicator. But how? How do we find those? And, and what have you focused on to help you achieve that compounding intentional living success? Sure. Yeah. I mean, Phil, my lead indicators today are, are, are more marketing <laughs> lead indicators than sales lead indicators, mostly. But I think like anything else, you know, I love this idea of reverse engineering the outcome, right? It's nothing new. But, you know, my lead indicators are typically, you know, the outcome for me is enrollment into my intentional living academy. So if I reverse engineered that, it happens to do with, uh, you know, webinar attendance and it happens to do with uh, book sales, right? And things of that nature. So from a business perspective, I have more marketing leading indicators than sales leading indicators, but there's a lot more to life than just work. So in my personal life, I have, you know, running cadence leading indicators. My goal is to run every other day. I have meditation leading indicators. Uh, I have conversations with my wife and date nights. You know, every two weeks we have a date night together. Those are some leading indicators. And if we can hit that, 80% of our quarters, if we can hit those, you know, every other week date nights, we have a really good 90 day period together, right? We have a really good quarter together. Uh, so you can create leading indicators out of anything, your health, your wealth, your relationships. Um, that's what's really exciting because those leading indicators give you that opportunity to course correct along the way. And as you know, like chapter two in my book is all about progress reports. And back in school, we had those progress reports. So what, what were the purpose of those? They were to help us course correct before report cards came in. I mean, isn't that true? Report cards came in. It's like a P&L statement, too late, rearview mirror. That's looking back 30, 90 days, whatever it may have been, just like report cards in school. But by generating progress reports and identifying those and tracking those lead, leading indicators, not just in our work, but in our life as well, we can obviously course correct before it's too late, before we you know, eventually reach a major catastrophe in our life if we're caught asleep at the wheel, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so important. I always forget about progress reports, right? I mean, your book absolutely reminded me that, right? That being able to live more intentionally really has helped me focus on that because I forget, like, it's okay 
to take stock of where I am right now and then make a change, right? If I've got new information or if I've got sometimes new priorities, right? Sometimes, you know, things happen and we have to, right. we have to move right with that. And sometimes we're going this way and we recognize, oh boy, we really need to be going that way. So that's right. really, really important. That course correction before we get too far off track, but then how do we, how do we pull that back, Sean? Like take us through that. Cause in the book, you take us through some awesome exercises for making sure that we get back once we're kind of off that focus and unfocused and can move ahead in with purpose. Sure. Yeah, I think I, I think the, the trick is to identify these things early, right? Momentum, as we all know, is a powerful force regardless of its polarity. The further you go in the wrong direction and the further you, you know, uh, pick up momentum in the wrong direction, the harder it is to redirect that momentum the right direction. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I do uh, I do a progress report in my life and in my business once a week. That just seems to be the sweet spot for me. It gives me the awareness. That's all it is, 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 is an awareness tool, right? So it gives me that awareness early. I've gone too far down the track in the wrong direction so many times in my life that I know how painful that is, whether it's with your health. You know, I've battled addiction, whether it's with your wealth. I've obviously find, uh, struggled financially whether it's with your relationships, I've had my battles over there. I know how difficult it is to repair the damage when you go too far in the wrong direction. So I'm very, it's very motivating for me. It's easy, it's not difficult any longer to make those quick course corrections sooner than later because I know the result if I don't do what I need to do. Um, so I know some people who do that daily, that to me is a little bit um, too frequently. And I know people who do it on a monthly or quarterly basis, right? And then we've got our New Year's resolutions people. <laughs> you know, I was one of those people once before who do it once a year, you know? So I think we all have to just find our stride and we all have to realize what frequency makes the most sense based on where we are right now in life. What the demands look like, what roles we play in business, in the household and whatever else, what communities we're a part of, what our responsibilities are. So I think it all depends and it's, you know, as you, you know, read the book, you know that, you know, my job was to guide people through and discover what was best for them. Um, I, I like to think that we all need to be experts in our own life. You know, we need to be experts of ourselves, not of anyone else. And that's really my goal is to identify, you know, what is it that I want in life from life? Um, where is it I'm going? And ultimately, how is it I'm going to get there? And what do I do on a daily basis to make sure I'm moving the needle and gaining that momentum, which is such a powerful force in the right direction. And I love what you just said, you know, uh, it's the, the old who moved my cheese, right? It happens constantly. We, we move, you and I just went through a move. So some certain things change. We get into a new stage of life. We, we get a new job or we sell business, start a ne the next business. We get into a new relationship. I mean, you know, change is the only constant, right? So we need to be constantly looking at these things, making sure that, you know, what we're paying attention to are the things that truly matter for us. Because as you know, it's way too easy to go out of bounds and start drifting and go through the motions, right? Conventional wisdom, you know, suggests that we, we go to school, we get good grades. We maybe, some of us go right from high school into the trade. Some of us move on to earn a college de degree, advanced degree. We get that good job. It's like that conventional wisdom really screwed me up. <laughs> it's, it's never worked well for me, that, that herd mentality. So I think it's our responsibility to figure things out. And that's what that book was about, was just kind of be your guide as you go through this self-discovery for your own life, right? Yeah, absolutely. And to show you the power of each and every choice making such a big impact, which is really something that I found was super powerful about the book. I love that you talk about, you know, once a week is, is really good for you. If daily works, you know, go ahead and go daily. That's okay too, right? Ann McNeil here, she says, uh, picking up the momentum, right, is really important. Become an expert in your own life and kind of repeating what you hit, said here, Sean, right? How will I get there each and every day Love before it. it gets way off? So thank you, Ann, that's Love good. It. So Sean, what are some pitfalls though, man? Because this is sound, you know, this is pretty pie in the sky, man. Yay, I'm always going to make the right choice. Well, what happens, man? when we don't, or what are some of the pitfalls that we can avoid based on some decisions maybe that you've made or you've seen others make that have read your book or worked through your court? Yeah, you know, one of the things that's scary but also liberating is that there's no guarantees, right? There's no guarantees in life, there's no guarantees in business. And, 
what I've found, and I, I think we've talked about this before, Phil, but like some of the wrong choices that I've made in life turned out to be some of the best lessons I've learned. So I usually look at it through that frame. Like, look, I have to make a decision. I, I'm a pretty indecisive person. I'm working on that, but I tend to like dwell and just let these big decisions linger for too long. And we all know that some of the you know best business people out there are very decisive. So that's something I'm working on personally. But I, I think giving ourselves, letting ourselves off the hook and saying, you know, based on everything I know, based on my history, my experiences, you know, this appears to be the best choice or the best decision I can make today. But hey, if it's the wrong decision, you know, I'm sure there are some learnings and lessons along the way. And I will, you know, gain all that experience over the next however long it is. And that'll make me that much better, faster, stronger, everything else. Um, so I think indecision is definitely one of the pitfalls. Decision's a powerful thing, right? I mean, you make a decision and if you can go all in and commit to that one decision, it's amazing how fast you can move. It's amazing how much meaningful action you can take when you've fully made up your mind on something. All of a sudden, the path at times becomes clear, right? So I, I'm a little bit intrigued by this thing called decision. I know I need to work on it personally in my own life, but I also think there's some things working behind the scenes that really help to to get you where you're looking to go faster. And a lot of it too, I think happens to be this particular activation system, right? In your brain, that that function that helps you focus on the right things in your environment. I think it's said that like, you know, every second of the day, there are 11 million bits of information coming in through our five senses, you know, so that RAS, that function helps us take, you know, 50 bits, 50 every second out of that 11 million and tune into the right things. But without making a decision, especially as it relates to our careers, or am I going to improve my health, or am I going to pursue this relationship, or am I going to get out of this relationship? The moment that decision is made, oftentimes things show up in our environment. You know, the universe conspires with us, and we all of a sudden find those solutions sitting right in our lap. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome advice, man. So, folks, you need to make a decision. Be intentional about your life. I encourage you, pick up a copy of Sean's book. You can only get it right now in Kindle, PDF, or whatever from Sean, or audio book. Sean reads his audio book. The physical book will be out soon. You can find Sean at seanrosensteel.com. So, Sean, if you had one more piece of advice, what would that be? Before that piece of advice, if I may, um, uh-oh, it looks like Phil went out. He warned me about this. There's construction around his house. So here we go. You're stuck with me, everybody. Um, one thing we set up a little special for everybody in Phil's camp. If you go to my website, forward slash Phil G, the paperback is actually available. So if you order the paperback or the Kindle uh, version on Amazon, you can, or anywhere, really Barnes and Noble, wherever you shop, you can forward uh, a copy uh, of the receipt you can forward a copy of the receipt and I'll give you the audio audiobook version for free as well as my one page implementation guide. Uh, so Phil, I was just letting people know if you go to my website forward slash Phil G, there's some bonuses there. Uh, if you buy the paperback or the Kindle, whatever version, but uh, your question, one last message. Yeah. So I believe that in our final moments, Many of us will wonder if we passed or failed at this beautiful thing we all call life. And I think it's important to you know, make some of these tough decisions that we have to make today so that when we get to the end of our lives, which is inevitable for all of us, we will, won't have to wonder you know, about that difficult question. We can have no regrets. There was that book, The Five Regrets of the Dying by Bronnie Ware. And she was this palliative care nurse and she, you know, cared for patients in the last two to three weeks of their lives. And she recognized a pattern and she recognized that there was five common threads, common regrets of all of her patients. And the number one regret that she noticed was that people wish they would live, they would have lived a life that was truer to themselves and not one that other people expected of them. So that was very powerful when I read that book. And when I took that away, I thought, holy cow, you know, there's no better time to start than right now. It's all we have is the present moment, right? So. Awesome. So folks, so get started now. Get connected with Sean. Sean, thank you so much for your time today, for your insight as you always bring, man. It's always great to see you. And folks, go to seanrosensteel.com. Pick up your copy of the book. Get 
moving now. Be decisive. Sean's working on it, and you can too. Thanks, Thanks Phil. Everybody. Appreciate Please. you having me. Thank you. Thank you.